As soon as Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard how Joshua had captured Ai and had devoted it to destruction, doing to Ai and its king as he had done to Jericho and its king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them, he feared greatly, because Gibeon was a great city, like one of the royal cities, and because it was greater than Ai and all its men were warriors. So Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent to Hoham, king of Hebron, to Piram, king of Jarmuth, to Japhia, king of Lachish, and to Debir, king of Eglon, saying, Come up to me and help me, and let us strike Gibeon. For it has made peace with Joshua and with the people of Israel. Then the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon, gathered their forces and went up with all their armies and encamped against Gibeon and made war against it. And the men of Gibeon sent to Joshua at the camp in Gilgal, saying, Do not relax your hand from your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us and help us. For all the kings of the Amorites who dwell in the hill country are gathered against us. So Joshua went up from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear them, for I have given them into your hands. Not a man of them shall stand before you. So Joshua came upon them suddenly, having marched up all night from Gilgal. And the Lord threw them into a panic before Israel, who struck them with a great blow at Gibeon and chased them by the way of the ascent of Beth Horon, and struck them as far as Azekah and Makeda. And as they fled before Israel, while they were going down the ascent of Beth Horon, the Lord threw large stones from heaven on them as far as Azekah, and they died. There were more who died because of the hailstones than the sons of Israel killed with the sword. At that time, Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the sons of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Sun, stand still at Gibeon and moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jashar? The sun stopped in the midst of heaven and did not hurry to set for about a whole day. There has been no day like it before or since when the Lord heeded the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. So Joshua returned and all Israel with him to the camp at Gilgal. These five kings fled and hid themselves in the cave at Makeda. And it was told to Joshua, the five kings have been found hidden in the cave at Makeda. And Joshua said, roll large stones against the mouth of the cave and set men by it to guard them. But do not stay there yourselves. Pursue your enemies, attack their rear guard. Do not let them enter their cities for the Lord your God has given them into your hand. When Joshua and the sons of Israel had finished striking them with a great blow until they were wiped out, and when the remnant that remained of them had entered into the fortified cities, then all the people returned safe to Joshua in the camp at Makeda. Not a man moved his tongue against any of the people of Israel. Then Joshua said, open the mouth of the cave and bring those five kings out to me from the cave. And they did so and brought those five kings out to him from the cave. The king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon. And when they brought those kings out to Joshua, Joshua summoned all the men of Israel and said to the chiefs of the men of war who had gone with him, come near, put your feet on the necks of these kings. Then they came near and put their feet on their necks. And Joshua said to them, do not be afraid or dismayed. Be strong and courageous, for thus the Lord will do to all your enemies against whom you fight. And afterward Joshua struck them and put them to death, and he hanged them on five trees. 
and they hung on the trees until evening. But at the time of the going down of the sun, Joshua commanded, and they took them down from the trees and threw them into the cave where they had hidden themselves. And they set large stones against the mouth of the cave, which remain to this very day. As for Makeda, Joshua captured it on that day and struck it and its king with the edge of the sword. He devoted to destruction every person in it. He left none remaining. And he did to the king of Makeda just as he had done to the king of Jericho. Our Father God, we thank you so much that every word of scripture has been breathed out from your mouth. We thank you that through these words, your words to us, you will teach us and rebuke us and correct us and train us in righteousness. Please, Lord, today equip us for the good work of ministry. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, somebody told me, this is uh, somebody who's involved in student ministry, uh, spends their time working with students. He was telling me that the key apologetic question 20 years ago, the question that students who weren't Christians were asking, they wanted an answer to before they would consider Christianity, the key apologetic question was, is it true? And he was saying that now the most common defeat a belief is, will I be safe? In other words, if I sign up, if I, if I join you, if I commit to Jesus, will church be a safe place? And we want to say back to that loudly, don't we? Yes, the whole Christian story is about safety. It's about God making us safe. That's what salvation is all about. A safe home forever. That's what heaven is. That's what our future certainty is as Christians. Rest is what the Bible calls it, where everything is put right, where everything is as God intends it to be. It's safe and secure. No more, God promises. No more will all those things that spoil this world, no more will they spoil our experience. No more will pain or bullies or abuse spoil it, nor sin threaten it, nor anything unclean enter it. All sadness will be untrue. All tears will become belly laughs of mirth. In the new heaven and the new earth, every need is met, every longing fulfilled, every goal achieved, every sense satisfied. We see him, we're with him. He holds us and hugs us and whispers, this is for always. That's why it's such a scandal, isn't it? That's why it's so shaming when church here isn't safe. Most of you will know that the name Joshua and the name Jesus are the same. It's like Peter, Pierre, and Pedro, same name, just different languages. In, I was in Greece a fortnight ago, and I was speaking from this book of Joshua. And in the modern Greek Bibles, the book of Joshua is called Jesus, of course, Jesus, son of none, which kind of makes the point, doesn't it, that the the story of Joshua, the, the, the book of Joshua, that is the story of Jesus. He gives rest to his people. The Bible book of Joshua tells us how God does that, how rest comes about. Rest for the weary souls of the feet of his people. How he is going to deliver a, a safe and secure home, how he's going to get his people there. I've loved preparing this for you today, and I hope it's going to help you lots, just as it has helped me as I've been preparing it. So let's look down to our passage. Uh, in the journal on page 20, there's a place where you can make notes. Uh, we saw yesterday, didn't we, how... 
God amazingly had opened up the River Jordan as their entry point to the land. Uh, We watched him humble the mighty city of Jericho with words. And then Israel cut a swathe right to the middle of the land. It's a brilliant military strategy uh, because now all the tribal groups are divided. You've got north from south and Israel are camped in the middle. And chapters 10 and 11 describe how the land is taken. So chapter 10 is about taking all the land down in the south. Chapter 11 is about taking all the land in the north. And it ends with a summary towards the end of chapter 11. So chapter 11, verse 16, verse 23, twice we're told, same phrase, that Joshua took the whole land, all of it, south and north. But look at the very last verse of chapter 11. Here is where the story is heading to, so that the land had rest from war. So my first heading today is about how we enter his rest, how God gives land and rest to his people. Here it is then. The Lord fought for his people. The story starts with five Canaanite kings in verses three to five. And they form an alliance together, these five kings. They're going to help one another and they're going to attack Gibeon because Gibeon, who was one of them, has now defected to the Israelites. Verse four, come up with me, they say to one another, help me, let us strike Gibeon because it's made peace with Joshua and with the people of Israel. So the inhabitants of Gibeon come to Joshua, their new overlord, and they ask him to save them. Please come and help us, they say in verse 6. The men of Gibeon sent to Joshua at the camp of Gilgal, saying, don't relax your hand from your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us and help us. For all the kings of the Amorites who dwell in the hill country are gathered against us. So Joshua went up from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, all the mighty men of valor, And the Lord said to Joshua, do not fear them, for I've given them into your hands. Not a man of them shall stand before you. So you've got the picture on one side, you've got five kings. And on the other side, you've got Israel helping Gibeon. And notice what the Lord says in the middle of verse eight there. I have given these enemy armies into your hands. Uh, Most of the time that that word given get used in Joshua, uh, 80% of the times the word is used, it it talks about the Lord giving to Joshua or to Israel land or inheritance or peoples or nations or rest. The Lord giving those things to Israel. But here is the problem. This passage may well raise urgent questions for us. Giving the land, that's one thing. But giving people, giving the inhabitants of the land, clearing them away for Israel, as we heard yesterday, devoting them to destruction, that's something else altogether, isn't it? I mean, that sounds, well, not very nice. (laughs) Invasive imperialistic. It's a bit like contemporary ethnic cleansing. And God sanctions it. God commands it. God even seems to get cross when his people don't do it. Uh, There's a Virginia Woolf quote where she says, I read the book of Job last night. I don't think God comes out of it very well. And we might have a similar reaction to Joshua, and especially to a story like chapter 10. I I don't think God comes out of it well. I have a friend who was part of our congregation who said when he heard these things in Joshua, I just don't want a God like that. Actually, he left the church and went to another church where we would hear about a different God. What kind of a God is this? Is he good? Is he safe? What exactly is he doing with the nations of the world? But of course, if we don't want to end up worshipping an invented God, if we want to know the true God, who who he is, who he actually is, 
rather than who I might want God to be. Let's watch what he does so that we know who he is. And here is the point so far then. The Lord fought for his people. Look down to verse 10. The Lord threw them into a panic before Israel who struck them with a great blow and chased them and struck them. And as those allies fled, verse 11, the Lord threw down not so much hailstones. I think it's just stones he threw down. Super guided missiles that managed to miss the Israelites and hit and kill the enemy. And verse 11 says, more died because of the stones than the sons of Israel killed with the sword. And God goes further, much further as he fought for his people. He makes the sun be silent, literally, in verse 12. He shut up the sun. It stood still, verse 13. The moon stopped. Now, there are a couple of problems with this as well. One is a translation problem. Apparently, there's some debate how to translate this. It, it could be about day being extended, or it could be about night being extended. Uh, maybe it was dark because of the solar eclipse, or dark because of all the stones coming down. Exactly what was the phenomenon? But the other problem is what we might call the science problem. Uh, we know that the Earth circles around a stationary sun. So it should be the earth that stands still, not, not the sun. Uh, and anyway, if this were to happen, there, there'd have been catastrophic implications for gravity, for the planet. Uh, we have an astrophysicist doing Cornhill at the moment. We don't often have one of those. So I went to him and said, what would happen, Mr. Astrophysicist, if this were to happen? And I think I understood him as saying, that he thought the main effect would be water movement, that basically the seas would flow to the poles. So goodbye Australia and Canada, and all around the equator would be totally dry. So I checked it out on a science website that told me it's all right, such a thing can't and won't happen. There is absolutely no external force that could stop the planet in its tracks like that. Hmm, I think I might know of one. I know the one who hung the sun in the sky, who started it all. He began time, and all we did was make clocks. We get excited because an apple landed on a scientist's head. He thought up the idea of gravity. So do you not think that he can tell the sun and the moon to deviate from the laws of nature? Do you not think he can use the created order to fight for his people, to rout and crush his enemy? Of course he can. Don't you remember when he sneezed and liquid behaved like a solid at the blast of his nostrils? And then when he blew, the same water became waves, and the waves crashed over the heads of the Egyptians, and they sank like lead down to the bottom of the deep Red Sea. It's worth asking the science professor, isn't it? Is your objection, is it to this story, is it, or is it to the whole idea of God in the first place? The thing we are sure about, because we're told it in verse 14, the thing that we're absolutely clear that certainly happened is that God fought for his people. In this unique day, this day like no other, this day marked with this extraordinary significance of cosmic upheaval, this king of glory, this man of war, this Lord strong and mighty shatters his enemies which may not fit with what we think God ought to be like. One commentary puts it like this. The popular image of God is that he's kind and tender, soft and prissy, and comes to us reeking of hand cream. 
Not this God. Not the God of Joshua chapter 10. This God is a mighty man of war who fought for his people. Why does this matter? Well, it matters because if we are Christians, the one who is for us is mightily for us. Colossians chapter 2 tells us that at the cross, there was a fight and a victory as the Lord Jesus triumphed over powers and authorities and disarmed them, as we were hearing yesterday afternoon. Mighty to bind the strong man and release captives. He won. And if our God is a powerful warrior like that who fights for us, then who can be against us? Well, actually, of course, loads of things are against us. Sin, suffering, death, to to name just three of the things in Romans chapter 8. But as Paul asks there in, in that chapter in Romans, which of those things can prevail against us? Not one, no one, if this God, this God is for us. None of those many enemies he lists, none of them can prevail. None of them will win. None of those things can even get a rizzler between our God and those he loves. I am safe with him. Actually, when you think about it, I can only be truly safe If he is a God like that, he needs to destroy enemies so that I can be safe. So that he can whisper in my ear, this is forever, for always. So I want a God like that, don't you? I want a God, the one who is for me is strong enough to prevail for me. The Lord fought for his people. He won. No enemy stood Which leads to our second point, that the Lord will put all of our enemies under our feet. The story continues. Israel capture the five kings of this five-nation alliance and seal them up in a cave. And then they pursue the leaderless army and wipe them out before Israel return victorious back to camp. We pick up the story in verse 22. Then Joshua said, open the mouth of the cave and bring those five kings out to me from the cave. So they did so. They brought those five kings out to him from the cave, the king of those five places. And when they brought those kings out to Joshua, Joshua summoned all the men of Israel and said to the chiefs of the men of war who'd gone with him, come near, put your feet on the necks of these kings. And they came near and put their feet on their necks. And Joshua said to them, do not be afraid or dismayed. Be strong and courageous. For thus the Lord will do to all your enemies against whom you fight. What? I mean, what? Put your feet on the necks of these kings. Feet on their necks to humiliate them? to rub their noses in it? I mean, what is going on? Well, no wonder alternative readings have been suggested as an attempt to deconstruct the problem. So liberal theologies would say, let's think of Israel as a primitive rural people, and they are overcoming technologically advanced city-states all the way from Egypt to Canaan. Good on Israel, the little guy triumphing. The opposite reading would be a post-colonial reading that says, aha, this story shows the danger of religious fundamentalism, oppressing the indigenous people groups and doing it in the name of God. Boo hiss to Israel, the nasty invading foreigner. Thankfully, the Bible tells us how to read the story. Look down to verse 25. We've got another great statement about God. We've seen that first one, that the Lord fought for Israel. And now, end of verse 25. Do not be afraid or dismayed. Be strong and courageous, for 
Thus the Lord will do to all your enemies against whom you fight. The Lord will put all our enemies under our feet. And this ought to ring big Bible bells for us. Let's take a few steps back. Let's go back to Adam. Remember his role? The role he was given was to subdue, to have dominion. Psalm 8 tells us that he was made a little lower than the angels. He was crowned with glory and honor, and all things were put under his feet. But of course, famously, Adam let something that was under his feet, something created, become his master and start to tell him what to do. He, he believed lie and served a creature rather than the creator. He let himself be subdued by a snake. And the rest of the Bible then tells us, doesn't it, that the one who will tread things under his feet, the one who will be the serpent crusher that we need, the one who is rightly crowned with glory and honor, that one is Jesus, the man, the true Adam, who did what the first Adam should have done. He's the one given authority and power, now at the Lord's right hand, sitting there to judge the nations. The Lord has given the nations into his hand as his heritage, his possession. He's going to crush the rulers of the whole earth, as Psalm 110 describes it. He's going to make his enemies his footstool. Until at the end, after destroying every rule, every authority, every power, after he's put his feet on the necks of his enemies, he delivers the kingdom to God the Father. This Jesus, this victorious Jesus, and here's the interesting thing, he shares his victory with us. The Lord's people share in his victory. The Lord will put all our enemies under our feet. Please would you turn with me to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. And this is the passage where Jesus sends out 72 disciples. And we're told in verse 3 that he sends them out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Uh, my son last year moved to a rented house on the Cotswold Wildlife Park. It's a very strange situation because when you're lying in bed, you can hear lions roaring. And when you go out the front door, there are giraffes in the field next door. But right next to his cottage is a massive fence with rows of barbed wire across the top because he lives next to the wolves enclosure. Now, I've never seen a lamb amongst wolves. The fence is giving me a good idea of what it would be like. I checked it online. My suggestion is you don't check it online. Uh, but basically, what you expect with lambs in the midst of wolves is blood all over the carpet. But when they come back, verse 17, and this is the surprising verse in the passage, when they come back in verse 17, they come back, we're told, with joy rather than with battle scars. And they say to Jesus, do you know, it wasn't us who was driven out. It was the demons. We commanded them in your name, and they were subject to us. They just went. Lord, it was brilliant. Lord, you should have been there. Lord, I think you are unduly pessimistic about what it's like doing mission. It was amazing. And Jesus agrees in verse 19, and he says, yes, he had indeed given that authority to tread on serpents and scorpions. He'd given them authority over all the power of the enemy. In other words, what you've just seen, boys, it's part of a huge cosmic battle in the spiritual realm. And it's not just demons, but actually Satan himself, their master, verse 18, he too is struck down. That's the reality of what's been going on as you take the gospel into the wider world. The woman's offspring is crushing the head of the serpent. And we, his disciples, 
share in that. Authority was given to us by Jesus to tread on scorpions and snakes like Satan to be victorious over them. In the first verses of chapter 1 of Joshua, Joshua is told that every place that the sole of his feet treads on, all of that is given to him, wherever he puts his feet. So as his feet walk him into the land, as every step he takes marks out the land, as he claims ownership of the land by that symbolic act of walking in in it and pressing his feet down into the sand and leaving his footprints there. As he does that, the Lord is with him, fighting for him and giving to him the land that he'd promised. And here in Joshua chapter 10, he shares that victorious advance. His people now put their feet on the necks of the defeated kings of the south, treading our enemies under our feet, bruising their heads, With our heels, the Lord shares his victory with his people. Do you know that verse in Romans chapter 16 where Paul promises that the God of peace will crush Satan? That's an interesting conjunction of ideas, isn't it? The God of peace will crush Satan. Of course, there only can be peace if Satan is crushed. There only can be rest if every enemy is destroyed. But anyway, the, the God of peace will crush Satan under whose feet? What do you expect it to say next? The God of peace will crush Satan under, we expect him to say, under the feet of Jesus. But he actually says the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. The feet of the ordinary Christians in Rome. Now, what does this mean for us as the New Testament people of God? What does it mean for Christians? And it seems to me that what Luke 10 does, in fact, what the whole New Testament does, is to take the language of Joshua 10 and apply it to world evangelization. That's how Christians subdue the world. Not by the Crusades of the Middle Ages, but as Jesus says to his disciples, go just as Joshua is commanded to go. Go into all the world, we're told. Go and make disciples, we're told. Disciples of every nation, of every generation, the whole world over. And as we do that, Satan's citadel is crumbling. He is being crushed. The Lord's people share in the Lord's victory as the gospel, the word of truth, bears fruit and increases the whole world over. Now, unless you've watched Shiny Happy People, which is a four-part docuseries on Amazon Prime, you may not have heard of the Joshua generation or know what that is, but it's a, a whole movement in America that is committed to raising up a generation into positions of power in government so that America can be restored as a Christian nation. That's the Joshua generation. But what we're seeing from the book of Joshua is that this is much more linked to the Joshua project. You know what that is? Reaching the least, group, the least reached people groups with the gospel. Joshua is much more the Joshua project than the Joshua generation. It's not by wrestling against flesh and blood. It's not by fighting with the weapons of the world. It's not by military might, but by a work of the Spirit of God. And yes, it is with a sword, for sure. We wield, though, the sword of the Spirit, the sharp scalpel of the Word of God, the weak-seeming cross, the Weak seeming gospel that the word of the cross, that is the power of God. And armed with that, we are sent 
by the raised from the dead, Lord and Christ, the one to whom all authority in heaven and on earth has been given. So get this, every time you or I explain the gospel to somebody, it's a Luke 10 moment. Actually, it's a Joshua 10 moment. And we need to see that cosmic dimension to every talk we give, every Bible study we lead, every conversation where our Bible is open with somebody else and we're pointing people to Bible truth. In all that, we are engaged in spiritual warfare, treading on serpents like Satan, victorious over them, telling the demons where to go, presiding over the last throes of the enemy. Yabu sucks to you, Satan. Wow. No wonder the disciples come back rejoicing in that. And the only reason why we, we dare to go to take the gospel into the world so that nations are discipled and baptized and taught, the only reason we would dare to go is because he's Lord over it all. Jesus has no postcode. Every inch is his. Every inch of the world has his footprints all over it. There's not one place where it's inappropriate to say, Jesus is Lord here. So that includes us going to our friends, of course. Yes, Jesus claims lordship there. He sends us to invade their personal space with the gospel of the sovereign king. It includes us going to our locality, Muslim, Sikh, or nothing. Let's knock on their door and tell them about the victorious king. But let's not stop there. If, if our, the extent of our vision was just our locality, large sections of Britain would never hear. Large sections of the world, too. Jesus is far more ambitious. He sees the so-called black spots in our country where you'd have to drive for 30 minutes or more to find the nearest church where the Bible is preached faithfully. Go there too. Conquer hearts and minds and wills. Captivate people with the beauty of the king. And he sees the whole world. All of it is in his sights. Brazil, Nigeria, Thailand, where it's illegal to evangelize. Singapore, where it's illegal to say that Jesus is the only way. I read some research that said by, by the year 2050, so what's that, 20, 27 years away, by the year 2050, in sub-Saharan Africa, 20% of the world's population will live. And, and here is the startling statistic, 40% of the world's Christians. Which direction do you think missionaries are going to be traveling in 27 years' time? They're going to be going north or south? As African Christians see the desperate situation in the UK and the UK church, thank God they will come and help us. We need them. Somebody here this week I met yesterday who is a missionary just like that, sent by Ethiopia to help evangelize pagan Britain. Thank you for coming. Because we want to bring all nations, including the UK, including your home country, back from straying like sheep so that we are under the rule of the shepherd and overseer of our souls. Individuals willingly submitting their necks to his gentle yoke delighting in his commands, joyfully submitting to their true master, bowing the knee willingly before the king. That's how the nations are won. That is how we subdue the earth. And that is how we tread on scorpions and snakes. That is how rest comes about. Of course, that is why the, the playlist of heaven, the, the soundtrack of the new creation, is how wonderful the gospel is. That's what got me here. That's what made this safe. That's what secured rest for me. 
Will I be safe? Oh, yes. 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 The Lord is for us. He fought for us to defeat every enemy. Through the gospel, Satan is bound and destroyed, and our names are written in heaven, in safety, for always. The Lord fought for his people. The Lord will put all our enemies under our feet. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, this is just so wonderful that you are the majestic, glorious king who has all authority over heaven and earth. That claims every inch of this world as yours. All the nations have been given to you as your inheritance, your heritage. It is all yours. And thank you that through the gospel about your saving work, Satan is being defeated. People are being released from the strong man. People are being made safe forever. How wonderful is this gospel, and we praise you, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen.